the max time distance here. Okay, so thank you for the introduction. And um, in the keynote today, we have seen that composability in distributed systems is important. And there was also this question about high-level language abstractions for composing distributed systems. So in this talk, we propose a language design that allows for composing distributed systems using a module system for distributed multi-tier languages. So lots of modern software is inherently distributed, but developing distributed systems is hard. There are many issues that developers have to deal with, like, for example, keeping data consistent, keeping data available by replicating it, making the system tolerant of faults, and also handling the communication between the different hosts to implement a distributed functionality. And this talk will focus on the last part, so on language abstractions for implementing distributed functionalities in a modular way. And let us first have a look at how state-of-the-art real-world distributed systems are developed today. So what you can see here is an example for this. This is actual code taken from the Apache Flink stream processing system. And here we have two components, a red component and a blue component, that may run on different hosts. And these components are part of Flink's task scheduling and task deployment logic. So those two components are two actors communicating, and as usual in actor systems, they communicate by exchanging messages. So here I marked all the places where messages are sent from one component to the other. And just from looking at the code, it's not really clear where these messages are handled, or if they are handled at all. So I manually checked where these messages are processed, and this is what you can see here. So you may wonder if this is really the most intuitive way to model data flow in a distributed system. And this is also just a small part of the entire application, so there are many more components in the distributed system that essentially communicate in the same way. And there is a class of languages called multi-tier languages, which allow you to implement a distributed application in a more coherent way. And the idea there is that you can write your entire application in a single compilation unit, and the compiler automatically generates the code for the different components for you. So our Scala Loki language addresses multi-tier programming for generic distributed architectures, and the way we achieve this is through placement types. So let me quickly introduce placement types to you. So since Scala Loki is a Scala embedding, let's have a look at some Scala code. This is standard Scala, what we see here. And by its type, we know that task is probably some kind of list that contains tasks. And this could live on any component. So placement types now allow us to talk about placement explicitly in the language. So here we say that this is a list on the master component. So the complete type of task is list of task on master. And this means we encode placement information at the type level. And now, of course, we also want to place actual code that gets executed on a specific component, and we do this by wrapping code in code in a placed expression. So in this case, we call this get task list method on the master component, and because by the placement type explicitly ascribed to the expression, we know it's placed on the master. And we can then freely define the components of our distributed system as Scala type members. So here we have master peer and the worker peer in our distributed system. Now, using this example of the master and the worker, we can then specify the distributed architecture using those peer types. And the way we define the architecture is by specifying ties between peers. So since the architecture is encoded into the Scala type system, we specify ties by using a tie type member. So in this case, we define that the master has a multiple tie to the workers, and the worker has a single tie to the master. And this type level encoding is the mechanism that we use to support different kinds of distributed architectures. And this architecture specification that we can see here models this kind of architecture where workers always connect to a single master and the master can connect to multiple workers. We can then also extend the specification for the worker peer, for example, such that it has a multiple tie to worker, which then models this kind of different architecture where workers can additionally connect among themselves. And using this kind of architecture specification gives us quite a flexible way to support different architectural models. And since this is all encoded at the type level, we can statically type check that remote access conforms to the specified architecture. Now, let me quickly come back to the Apache Flink task scheduling object that we've seen on the initial slides. So having distinct modules for every component of the distributed system and this kind of imperative message passing leads to this kind of scattered data flow. So the data flow that you see here looks very complex, but actually that complexity is accidental. So if you investigate the data flow more closely, you could see that you can express it in a pretty regular style. So we use Scala Loki to restructure the code into a multi-tier program. And since multi-tier code is itself distributed by using placement types, parts of the code are executed on the red component and parts are executed on the blue component. 
And this approach makes data flow explicit and easier to track since it is not interrupted by a manual message passing scheme, which also makes it easier to reason about the behavior of the system for the developer. And thanks to static type checking, we were able to eliminate non-exhaustive pattern matches and typecasts that could potentially fail at runtime. Now, the good thing is that we're not forced anymore to modularize along network boundaries, right? So we can implement the communication in this more straightforward way. But now we kind of have the problem that it's not clear how to modularize such multitude code in a proper way. And ideally, what we would like to do is to encapsulate different system functionalities into different modules. So for example, imagine we have a master that dispatches tasks to workers, and then the workers provide the result back to the master. So the way we would implement this traditionally is by developing separate modules for the master and for the worker, which can then be executed on different machines. But dispatching the task and retrieving the result conceptually belongs to the same functionality. So in fact, we have a single data flow here from the master to the worker and back to the master, and we want to encapsulate such distributed functionalities inside a single multi-tier module. So now let me present you a multi-tier module system for Scala Loki. So modularization is essential to support large code bases, but traditionally modules are confined to a single component of the distributed system. And our multi-tier module system allows for composing subsystem functionalities which are themselves distributed by disentangling distribution and modularization concerns. And we achieve this by defining peers as abstract types so keeping them open for composition. So in our approach, multi-tier modules are defined on abstract peer types, and we use peer types for specifying the distribution of code, so they basically represent logical locations in the distributed system and enable composition, and then we use standard Scala traits and objects for modularization. So peer types of different modules can be identified to unite different locations, which is the mechanism that we use to merge locations of independent modules. So let's have an example for abstract peer types. So here we have an offloading module, which is defined on a master peer and on a worker peer. And this offloading module uh, allows offloading tasks to worker nodes. Uh, and another module implements the functionality for monitoring if workers are still reachable, for example, using some kind of heartbeat mechanism. And let's assume there's a third module, task scheduler, which dispatches tasks to workers and also reschedules them in case uh, the worker is unable to provide the result. So this means that the task scheduler contains the functionalities for both the offloading module and the monitoring module. So we can just stack these modules to combine their functionalities. And the implementation of the offloading module contains the architecture specification and the module provides the functionality for dispatching tasks to workers through the run method and tasks are then executed on the workers by calling the execute method remotely. So we have an explicit remote call here which the module abstracts over. And the monitoring module also specifies its ar architecture and calls the monitor timeout method when the worker is not responding anymore. So we can then simply stack together these modules to create a task scheduler module that contains both the task dispatching and the monitoring functionality. And the way we do this is using Scala's mixing composition. So in Scala, we can simply specify that the task scheduler trait extends both the offloading trait and the monitoring trait. We also allow for defining abstract modules and concrete implementations. So for example, here we have an abstract backup service module for backing up data on a remote peer and the file backup implementation that just stores the data in the file system of the remote peer. So I will show you the code for the backup service module and its file backup implementation. So first we declare the different peer types to define the subsystem architecture, and then we see that we only specify an upper type bound using this less than colon notation, and by only specifying an upper type bound, we keep the peer type abstract and allow for later refining the type by giving a more specific type bound. And when, then we define the abstract methods that are placed on the peers on which this module is defined. So the backup service defines two abstract methods which allow the processor peer to load and store some data to the storage peer. And by defining both peers and placed values inside the module, we achieve modularization across peers. So now let's define the file backup implementation for this abstract backup service module. So the module defines methods for writing to and reading from the file system, and these methods are placed in the storage peer since the data is stored there. 
And these methods are defined private, so we use standard encapsulation mechanisms to hide implementation details. And the module, of course, provides implementations for the abstract methods from the interface, so it implements the store method of the processor peer by remotely calling write on the storage peer, and it implements load uh, by remotely calling read. So another way of composing uh, modules is to use a reference to another module. For example, an editor module can have a reference to a backup service module to store a remote backup of the file that is currently being edited. And when composing modules in such a way, we can combine their peers. So here, for example, we specify that the server is a storage peer and the client is a processor peer. And we do this by defining a subtype relation between those peers. So I will show you how this looks like in code. So here we have the editor module that references a backup service module. And usually code is developed against interfaces, so the backup reference is abstract. And then we combine the peers of both modules by refining the abstract peer types. So here we use Scala's path-dependent types to differentiating peers of different module instances. So we use this backup.processor to specify the processor peer of the backup module as an upper bound for client. So we make the client a processor, and we make the server a storage. And finally, we can create an instance of the editor module by instantiating a concrete backup service module implementation. So in this case, we create an instance of the file backup implementation. So we evaluated our module system using a more complete example of a distributed algorithm to ensure mutual execution when accessing a shared resource. So in our examples, the nodes in the distributed system first elect the leader and then the other nodes can acquire a log for accessing the shared resource from the leader that then either grants or denies the log. So we often have the case that a distributed algorithm relies on another algorithm, and to express this kind of dependency, we can specify constraints on multi-tier modules. So for example, the mutual exclusion module implements some locking functionality on instances of the peer type node, and then it requires a leader election functionality defined on this node peer type. So the mutual execution module is constrained over a leader election module, and we can stack it with a leader election algorithm. So in this case, we stack it with this Hirschberg-Sinclair module. So Hirschberg-Sinclair is just a specific leader election algorithm implementation. And this requires a node to have an ID, so we stack it with the random integer ID implementation, and finally we define the complete system over a ring architecture. So here we can see an overview of the modules that we can use here. So the brown boxes are abstract modules and the blue boxes are concrete implementations. And the lines with the circles represent these kinds of requirements in other modules. So we can see that we implemented different leader election algorithms like YoYo, Raft, and the Hirschberg Sinclair, which are provided as multi-tier modules, and we provide different predefined architectures. So here we can see the implementation of our constraint modules. So mutual execution has constraint on architecture and leader election and implements methods for locking and unlocking the shared resource. We use Scala self-type annotation to express such constraints. And in a similar way, leader election has constraints on architecture and ID, and ID is a constraint on architecture. So Hirschberg Sinclair is an implementation of the abstract leader election module, so it extends leader election, and implementation can also specify further constraints. So since the Hirschberg Sinclair leader election works on rings, it specifies a constraint on a ring architecture. And finally, we can just mix together the modules to define the mutual execution functionality for a node peer type, and the compiler checks that all constraints are satisfied. So coming back once more to the Apache Flink task scheduling logic, so on the right side, we can see a part of the multi tier version where data flow is implemented in a more direct way. Um, this code is the multi tier version of the Flink task distribution system that is not modularized yet. So it doesn't fit completely on the slide. The code is about three times as long, and it's this kind of longish piece of code that mingles different distributed functionalities inside the single compilation unit. But now that we have everything in place for our modular system, we can finally modularize the Apache Flink task scheduling logic to evaluate how our modular system can be applied to a real world code base. And now on the right side, you can see the result, the modularized version of the complete task scheduling logic, including the parts that are cut off on the left side. So all gray boxes are different multi-tier modules that span over the red and the blue component, and they are all composed into this big light gray subsystem, which is the Apache Flink task distribution system. So we keep the simplified communication patterns inside every module, and so we can combine the benefits of multi-tier programming and multi-tier development. 
So we implemented the different functionalities of the task scheduling system as different modules. Every module, like the one that you can see here, first specifies the peers on which the module is defined, and then it specifies the methods placed on those peers. And we implemented all the different modules for task assignment, checkpointing, and so on. And we simply stack them all together to compose them into the task distribution system. So the implementation of this language and our case studies are available on GitHub. So if you're interested, uh, feel free to check out our GitHub page, scalaloki.github.io. And to conclude this talk, I presented a multi-tier module system for Scala-Loki, a language for developing generic distributed systems using a coherent multi-tier programming model based on the idea of abstract peer types which enable distributed functionalities to be composed. Our code is available open source on our website, and more details about this multi-tier module system and further evaluation results can, of course, be found in this eco paper. And if you're interested, other abstractions of Scala Loki are presented in our last year's Oopsla paper. So, thank you for your attention. Thanks very much. That was wonderful. And uh, may I say, what beautiful slides and animations. <laughs> Thanks. Um, could I ask Vlad to come and start setting up his laptop? Thank you. Uh, so we have time for a couple of questions. So I, I had one. Um, so I guess it's kind of a general comment about wh that whenever you raise the level of abstraction for the programmer, um, there seems always to be a, a, the risk uh, that you make things harder to debug because you're getting the compiler to do more. Right, um, right. Is that something that's a risk in, in your particular setting? Well, so, so the question of debugging, that's, that's indeed uh, some problem in general for distributed systems, right? So my intuition is that having this higher level language abstraction where we have some kind of more information about the structure of the distributed system should make debugging easier, ideally, but uh, we are currently not working on, on implementing a debugger or something like this, but uh, I, I think this should still be a step in the right direction also for, for improving debugging, I hope. Thank you. Any other questions? Nope. In which case, let's thank our speaker again.